Well, folks, it's time for another Marvel Snap card review. We got the final confirmation uh, for what the March 2023 cards are going to look like in a recent developer update. I like to wait to get the final word on those developer updates. Sometimes the data mine versions that come out early can get uh, changed over time. But we've got four exciting new cards this time around. Uh, the Season Pass card Nimrod and a few others that uh, definitely seem to have some really interesting play patterns. Some, some high complexity, I think, in a couple of these cards. Now, I know with Series 5 cards, it sucks. It's not many people get to play with them. It's really unfortunate. It's a bit bittersweet to even look at new cards. But I still think it's useful and helpful to have an idea for what's being released and what kind of decks might pop up and the sort of things you might expect to play against sometimes even if you're not playing them yourself of course marvel snap needs to make new cards more accessible to people we've had this conversation a thousand times i'll continue to have it though because it remains true and it puts a real damper on the excitement around new cards i know uh that said we're still going to talk about these so everybody's fully prepared for the stuff that's coming out now, our first card for the video, Nimrod, is actually a little bit more accessible because this is going to be the season pass card for the month. I know a lot more people pick up the season pass. Nimrod here is a new five energy, five power card. And he reads, when this is destroyed, add a copy to each other location. So not particularly exciting here at five power at a base level. But of course, if you're destroying this, that's already a 10 total power card for five. That feels a little bit better. And then, of course, if you're destroying this multiple times, then you can create some really crazy cool chains here where Nimrod... Uh, is getting uh, much, much larger and stacking his stats across the board, kind of duplicating every single time. And I think there are actually some really interesting ways to do that as well. Think about cards like Galactus, for instance. Uh, you could play down a Nimrod on five and then actually a surprise Galactus on six, which currently doesn't ever really work very well because like Galactus and Wolverine aren't big enough usually to, to take a lane by surprise. But with Nimrod, it might be. If you have the Nimrod in the right spot, you could end up with 10 surprise power from Nimrods behind your Galactus. Also, maybe a four power Wolverine. Suddenly, you're talking about a 16 power Galactus lane out of nowhere. That could definitely be enough to surprise people sometimes and take the win. And on top of that, of course, is that you can actually scale up the stats of the Nimrod as well. If you play a Shuri into a Nimrod now, he's actually a 10 power Nimrod. So you could have Shuri Nimrod Galactus and wow, suddenly two 10 power Nimrods backing up your Galactus all on the final turn. If your opponent's not ready for that, man, that could actually be a really sneaky way to win. If that deck became too meta, of course, people would start to expect it a little bit. But the thing is, you wouldn't have to commit your whole deck to this like Galactus game plan. You wouldn't necessarily need waves and electros and stuff. So you could maybe just play a good destroy deck or a good Shuri deck with Nimrod in there and give yourself these different surprise angles to go. So I think that could be a possibility for Nimrod again. I know, Galactus Series 5 card, <laughs> sure, not everybody has, I get it. But you get the ideas as far as developing the top end of the meta. Now, of course, I don't think that's the only only way to go for Nimrod. There's also, of course, other great destroy synergies for this one. Something like an Arnim Zola basically allows you to kind of double up on the Nimrod effect here, uh, shifting extra Nimrods to the other locations. That's both extra power, but also redistributing stats, perhaps in a surprising way where your opponent's not ready or you're suddenly shifting into uh, two other locations instead. That's pretty sneaky. Other hand buff cards like Nakia as well could be a way to, to fuel your Nimrod or a Forge or whatever could get this bigger too if you're trying to get some copies out and then just regular destroy cards probably aren't terrible with this something like a carnage you need fuel for your carnage if you want to play a carnage late in the game nimrod's a great way to put a body in there that still has some upside and then venom is perhaps an even more interesting example where you can use this to get some big stats into your venom but then not lose the stats as is the case with many other cards because nimrod is shifting into those other spots so ultimately just a big uh destroy fuel sort of card that allows you to shift stats around get extra stats i think that's pretty cool a couple different ways i could see that going i think it's very likely one of those sticks in a in a good deck in some fashion or another it is expensive right at five energy this is a card that's coming down later so you don't have a lot of time to set up for it like right now a lot of destroy decks want to destroy things early and then have the big kind of death wave uh, death and whatever other card pop off late in the game. Nimrod doesn't really fit that play pattern particularly well because you're going to have to be doing your destroying late in the game and he's probably going to have to be what you're building around for your power and surprise factor late in the game. So, you know, this doesn't necessarily slot into destroy decks as they currently exist, but I think interesting enough perhaps to to inspire a couple different ways to play destroy decks instead, which that's pretty cool, I have to say. 
I also want to note real quick, we're going to talk about another card in this video, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, which actually might be a sort of preemptive enabler for Nimrod, where you play this down beforehand and then Nimrod on top of the Negasonic Teenage Warhead, which for most of our destroy effects right now in the game, they're uh, they're, they're happening after the card is played. They're, they're coming down later. So having a preemptive way to do this does perhaps fix some of that energy awkwardness a little bit, because you might be able to play this on five and already have destroyed it and then still do some cool stuff with it uh, on turn six, possibly as well. So um, some synergies there to keep an eye on as well as we'll talk about more of it later in the video. But I think Nimrod's a really cool looking card. And uh, for whatever reason, I remember this dude uh, in action figure form. I had like a Nimrod action figure as a kid that I always loved a lot. So also hitting some, uh, some nostalgia vibes for me here with Nimrod. So very excited to play this one. All right, so next up here we have Kitty Pride, and uh, this card's kind of complicated. There's a lot going on with this one, and uh, I'm going to have to break down how we think it works. And I say we because I've got a pretty good idea for this card, and after reading some consensus on Twitter, I, I think most people agree this is how Kitty Pride is going to work, although technically still open for interpretation, of course. Uh, Kitty Pride is a new 1-0, and it reads, you can return this to your hand to gain plus two power. So what that means is like once Kitty Pride's been played out, you can pull it back and keep it in your hand to get plus two power and then replay it again. Now there are two interpretations there, right? Like theoretically, you could pull this back every single turn and then immediately replay it within the same turn and it would get plus two per turn. Uh, basically through the, the, the first uh, or the final five turns of the game and uh, would be a huge 10 power card that you spent a total of six energy on because you're playing it every single turn. That's an interpretation, but I don't think that's going to be how this works because really the way Marvel Snap works, if you pull a card back to your hand and then you just replayed it right away, like immediately as your next action, that's like you didn't do anything. You can do that with every card in Marvel Snap in your hand because that's you deciding not to play it. That is basically the same function as undoing all of your actions. So the consensus agreement so far for Kitty Pride is that actually you'll you'll basically need to hit the in turn button to lock in each phase of Kitty Pride. So what that means functionally is that you play this on turn one, you hit in turn. She's a one zero. You pull this back on turn two, you hit an in turn, she becomes a one two that locks in the action of you having pulled her back because otherwise you didn't really do anything, right? There's no phase change at all. The in turn signifies the phase change, the locked action, the choice for Kitty Pride. So then, so then you go into turn three, you play Kitty Pride again as a one two, right? You hit in turn, she's on board as a one two. Then uh, on turn four, you pull her back again. You hold her in, in hand on turn four, you hit in turn, she becomes a one four. And then on turn five, you play her out as a one four again. Uh, you hit in turn, she's a one four on board. Theoretically on turn six, you could pull her back and make her a one six at the end of the turn. That would probably only be good in a magic deck where you could play her on turn seven. So most of the time, I think she's gonna end up as a four power card on board on turn five. And ultimately, you'll have spent three energy on her because you got to play her each time and, and spend that one energy. So basically, a Cyclops stat line here over multiple turns. You're getting kind of a 3-4. Again, that is the expectation for this card just based on the mechanics and functions of Marvel Snap. And a 3-4, of course, is not exciting in its own right. We're not playing Cyclops for the stats, right? It just doesn't make sense. But, of course, the action of replaying these cards does have other benefits and upsides. With cards like Angela and Bishop that scale off cards being played, then having this thing that you can play turn after turn and not occupy board space with it can actually be a beneficial way potentially to scale up some of those buffing cards like Angela and Bishop, um, which could be nice because sometimes you have board problems with Angela in particular where you can't get your Angela big enough. So it's, it's almost like every time you pull this back, you're getting maybe like plus four or plus five if you consider some of those other buffing cards. And in something like a zoo deck, you know, you got Kazar in there and suddenly this one drop's getting buffed. It's, it's fueling some of your other scaling cards. That, that has some intrigue, that has some promise. And it's not really like a three, four because you're getting this mana flexibility over time, right? You can actually kind of... Uh, 
choose when you're playing this and you're not occupying an entire turn for it or anything. So that extra flexibility might also help in regards to Kitty Pride. And if your deck is running a bunch of one cost cards anyway, you know, a one four is going to be one of the better one cost powers you're going to have. Most of them are going to be one, two, maybe one, three, if they got some downsides, right? So one four, it, one four is actually significant, especially if it's buffing other stuff. So I do actually think this kind of makes sense in that zoo environment. Also, because of the fact that you can uh, maybe uh, like play her on turn six instead of on turn five, because you don't really want to pull her back for that final turn six. You've also got a little bit of flexibility there at the end of the game. For instance, if you want to play a blue Marvel on turn five and you don't feel like playing your Kitty Pride out, it's okay because you're not going to pull her back on six anyway. So you can just hold her on five and then play her on six and help fill in your curve for one of those big surprising one fours on turn six. I mean, I guess it won't be a surprise because your opponent will have seen it, but a big surprise dump all in total with Kitty Pride and other cards as well. I think I mapped that out right. Forgive me if some of them, <laughs> I think I mapped that out right, but a lot of complexity. So forgive me if I, if I said anything wrong or misspoke throughout all of that. There's clearly a lot of detail and I've already recorded this twice. So <laughs> we're going to stick with this one either way. So, you know, I do think specifically in a zoo deck or something, that's pretty cool. Outside of that, I don't think most decks are going to value the stat gate on this one nearly enough uh, to be worth it. I just don't see how that's going to make uh, any particular sense. So perhaps a pretty narrow card, but still intriguing within that that niche of the uh, the Kazar Swarm, Kazar Zoo, Angela Zoo type stuff. Maybe Kitty Pride does actually make a little sense. So next up here we have Master Mold. Uh, this guy looks really cool. A new 2-2 two, two. with an on reveal at two Sentinel to your opponent's hand. You probably don't need a recap on Sentinels, but just in case I've included it there on screen. And uh, the idea with this card is is twofold, I would say. Number one, filling your opponent's hand and keeping it full can be great for cards like Ronin, the devil dinosaur for your opponent's hand uh, is, is Ronin. We've already seen some people playing around with Ronin decks with Sandman and and, and certain cards like that. Uh, Maximus and, and Baron Mordo kind of fit in with that package. So this is another way to keep your opponent's hand really full because they can't really get rid of the Sentinels in most scenarios because they play the Sentinel and another one comes back. So you're making sure that a few cards are gonna be in your opponent's hand basically at all times with these Sentinels, which can also be disruptive for uh, other kinds of decks, like a Dracula deck, for instance, that's trying to rely on a really big hit on an Infinite that they've narrowed their hand down to. You can drop Master Mold and suddenly they've got a Sentinel in their hand and their Dracula hits a Sentinel and they're like, oh my God, are you serious? So there's uh, disruption value against specific cards like Dracula. There is enable value for things like Ronin, but I think there's also just a more generalized combo disruption potential here as well, where if your opponent is sitting on a bunch of cards and trying to draw into specific stuff and their hand is getting kind of full, I know we've all played those combo decks where we don't really have much to do until like turn four or five or something. You got like Shuri, Red Skull, whatever. Well, uh, if they're sitting on a bunch of cards, you play a Master Mold in the mid game, you might just take up their final two card spots in hand and then they can't draw any new cards and then they might miss out on their big combo piece, their big finisher. It might make it harder for them to find Galactus or whatever it might be. You can imagine lots of future scenarios uh, where opponents are trying to find specific sorts of cards and instead their hand is clogged up with these garbage Sentinels that they absolutely cannot get rid of. And of course you can play that with other mill style cards like the Baron Mordos, the Maximuses and so on if you wanted to try to really uh, tie all of that together. So I do think this card has some pretty interesting lines. It feels weird, of course, to give your opponent resources and some decks might actually be pretty happy uh, just to get some Sentinels to fill some energy in the early games. Like, hey, yeah, I'll take these, man. And God forbid you play a Cerebro 3 deck that's like, oh yeah, hey, I needed I needed this, that's great. Uh, so there are some risks, there are some downsides, but I can absolutely imagine specific scenarios and specific metas where the Master Mold offers some surprising utility because of all those different things. And also this might be the final thing that makes like a, a Ronin deck really good, a mill style deck, as we call them other games, might actually be pretty decent on the back of something like Master Mold. We might finally hit that critical mass where you've got enough of those tools to make the huge Ronin and then, you know, Mystique to follow it up or whatever. And that's your big two power cards with some early game stuff. And that's a deck that could work just okay on the back of the Master Mold. I say just okay, maybe I should say promising, but I don't think it'd be like a tier one sort of thing. 
I actually love the idea of like making multiples of these somehow, copying the master molds, and just filling your opponent's hand with only sentinels so they can't actually draw any of their real cards. Might be kind of hard to do with Moon Girl at four, but maybe there are some other shenanigans and ways to get multiple master molds that completely ruins your opponent's game plan. So a lot of meme potential, a lot of disruption potential makes this card look really fun for me. All right, then our final card for the video here is Negasonic Teenage Warhead, a 3-4. Now, I do believe this one was data mined as a 3-2 previously, but final version of the reveal video is a 3-4, and it reads, after any card is played here, destroy this card and that card. Now, a uh, couple interesting things to note here. This is any card is played here. It's not after you play a card here, so... What that means based on the wording we have for other cards like titania for instance that means if your opponent plays a card in the same location as negasonic teenage warhead that will also trigger uh the effect of this card so there are really two ways to use this number one you could use this as a sort of uh, preemptive setup like we talked about before so that you could play something like your Nimrod after your Negasonic Teenage Warhead and immediately activate him so that you might get more total triggers possible for Nimrod because now you've got one on turn five the same turn you're playing him and then maybe follow-ups on turn six as well and alternatively you can use Negasonic Teenage Warhead to remove or destroy something of your opponents preemptively if you want to like lock down a location and say hey you're going into turn five after playing Shuri I do not want you playing that big red skull in the right location or whatever. Then you can plop down an Negasonic Teenage Warhead and if they want to play the red skull, it's going to get destroyed and murdered by Negasonic Teenage Warhead. So uh, that's susceptible to being ruined if, they, <laughs> if they're, you know, not a Shuri uh, Red Skull deck where that lines up perfectly. Plenty of other decks might have something really small and tiny to just play really quickly. A Thanos Stone, for instance, wipe out your Warhead waste your three energy in effect uh, and trade off something really small for your Negasonic Teenage Warhead effect. And that's also a risk, of course, if uh, you're trying to use this as a setup play for something like your Nimrod. Your opponent might just take it out accidentally by playing cards right away, uh, right after your Negasonic Teenage Warhead, depending on reveal orders and such. That could be a risk as well. So this card has a lot of different layers and interesting directions to go as that kind of counter disruption card, as a setup card. There are some real mind games with this one, much like with Titania, if she comes down early, where it's about like who's playing cards here. Was Is this the turn they're going to play the Negasonic Teenage Warhead? Do I have to be careful that my card's going to get destroyed right away? There are so many different things to think about how this one's going to take shape. Now, ultimately, I think the effect is just big enough that it's going to be a pretty cool card. I think this is going to be useful uh, for decks to run as that potential disruptor, as a way to kind of protect the location in essence, limiting your opponent from developing something there on a given turn. That all sounds like it has some neat utility, and it's not like this is a really high cost card for that kind of effect. For a lot of destroy effects or, or, or countering style effects like that, we're usually spending a little bit more than three energy, but that's of course because this one does come with some risk that your opponent just negates the effect more or less uh, with something small. So I am really intrigued to see how this card shakes out. I did see Ben Brode also tweeted that this is like his favorite card in Marvel Snap or one of his most favorite cards in Marvel Snap, uh, probably because of all those layers of complexity and how exactly this card shakes out in play. So I think potentially a really interesting card from a power level standpoint and a really, really interesting card from a mechanical standpoint. So now it's time for some quick reviews where I rate these cards from one to four stars. So you guys can come back later and make fun of me when I said a card's gonna be great and it's terrible. Nimrod is a three star card. Kitty Pride is a two star card. Master Mold is a two star card. Negasonic Teenage Warhead is a four star card. And there you go, folks, that wraps it up. I'm actually really excited to play a lot of these, even though I'm not sure the power levels are super high on some of them. They all just have very neat mechanics, like stuff that's gonna be really fun to try out and see how well it works. Uh, in particular, I love the idea of mill decks, so Master Mold's really fun for me. Negasonic sounds really, really cool. And Nimrod, I just, something about this character, I, I love it, I don't know, he looks goofy. It's this big pink futuristic Sentinel guy, but uh, just nostalgia vibes, and I like the, the kind of duplicating effect here. So really looking forward to these. Curious to hear your thoughts on these cards down in the comments below. Thanks much as always for watching, and until next time, game on.